Hello, welcome to the Fancy Scientist podcast. I have a fantastic interview for you today. I interviewed Petros Christophus, who is an expert in human carnivore conflict. He owns his own organization where he helps people employ non-lethal methods to solving problems with carnivores. And this was inspired by a couple of events. First, I was on The Proof is Out There on the History Channel. And for filming our latest episode, the, the episode was focused on animal attacks. And we revisited the mountain lion charging Kyle Burgess, who was the Utah right runner slash hiker. I actually interviewed him in a former podcast episode. And I just wanted to hear what other people thought about that incident. So I came across a podcast that featured Petros, and I just loved listening to him talk about mountain lions and other carnivores. And then also in my Instagram, I followed somebody for business, and they were a mother too. That was like the whole focus of their Instagram. And they had a reel about a red fox. So it or more than it was about life and death. And when I saw it, I thought at first, okay, she's teaching her children about death because there was a dead red fox. They lived in a rural area. I thought the fox just died. But then I looked at it and I was like, this is a healthy fox. They probably shot it. And she did. And it was all about the fox getting her chickens and then her, them killing the fox. So I wrote a comment on it, a very nice comment explaining that killing wildlife does not solve this problem, and I was blocked. So I was inspired again to reach out to Petros to talk to him about this, this issue. What can we do if we, are, we do have animals like chickens and we want to protect them? There are lots of non-lethal solutions. So today I am super excited. Our conversation is wide ranging. It is so interesting. I really could talk to him for hours and hours. His group is Predator Detection and Deterrence. And I'm going to give you all the links at the end in the show notes. Enjoy. Hi, Pet Shows. Welcome to the Fancy Scientist podcast. I am so excited to have you here. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited. So let's start off. From the beginning, you have such an interesting career. Can you tell us how you got into this? Yeah, born and raised in the island of Cyprus, and I went to the University of Aberdeen in Scotland, studying zoology for my bachelor's. And in Scotland, you have the honors project is attached to your bachelor's. So I did my honors thesis in Scotland. I did it in captive wolf behavior. So I was into originally marine wildlife. And then I realized, oh, it's just the whales and dolphins that I really like. And then I realized, hey, I actually just like mammals and brought in that to terrestrial mammals. And then I realized, yeah, I actually just like predators. Yeah. I did captive wolf behavior in Austria. And then I came to Fresno and I did my master's in biology in the University of California State University, Fresno. And then it just kind of snowballed into, you know, doing independent human wildlife conflict work, you know, it's just accidentally, I want to say, is what happened. So it wasn't planned. It wasn't like the field that I was wanting to get into. I just wanted to do ecology and a lot of stuff, but it spoke to me. And so I was like, okay, this is interesting. Let's, let's investigate. And then it became one of the main occupations. When you got your master's, how did you choose your master's program? And what did you do your master's research on? Yeah, it was, my master's research was on the mammal use of the riparian, the San Joaquin riparian zone. So the San Joaquin River flows on the very top of Fresno. Uh, and there's different development that goes on into the river. There's areas that are preserved for wildlife. And then there's areas that are used for mining and recreational use and stuff like that. And so we put out cameras there to see if there were species that were avoiding certain areas or if there was temporally any difference and stuff like that. And so we did it. And for the, the police, I guess it was just kind of, I moved here. Well, uh, having, you know, I, I met my now wife and girlfriend in Scotland and I moved to Fresno with her and it just so happened that there was a program and there was a professor that, you know, was interested in what I wanted to do. And initially I went in there, uh, with the idea of doing societal perception of carnivores and how they change. 
Uh, but then we just kind of moved it to riparian in uh, use of mammals, but using camera traps, which is one of the main tools that I use now. So we got a lot of proficiency on that. Yeah. And how did you get involved in studying captive wolves in the first place? I have a lot of people who contact me or just part of my Facebook group, and they really want to do um, predator research, especially wolves. And it's now a pretty competitive field. So how did yeah. you get that, the captive wolf work? It's really competitive. It was, it was just a combination of, I was told, you know, during the honors thesis that if I were to do field work, it would be very hard for me to get the data that I wanted to do an honors thesis, you know, because they want you in and out. They want you to basically collect your semester over the summer, your data over the summer and write your thesis report. And so we looked into the idea of captive wolves. At that point, I had volunteered at a wolf sanctuary called Wolf Watch UK, which is basically takes when the UK has officially banned wolves and wolf dogs as, as pets. So that sanctuary's purpose was to basically take those animals and just let them basically die in a nice area, right? As opposed to someone's house or whatever. And then that's how I got my toes dipped into the captive wolf, wolf world. And then I found out Wolf Watch, sorry, the Wolf Science Center in Austria that does a lot of research on comparing dog cognition and wolf cognition. And so I reached out to them. And at that point, they had a three month program. And I believe now it's all six months. Um, but you can go in there and volunteer essentially to, and also collect data from your thesis. So you're giving the center your labor essentially, but you're allowed to collect and they patch you up with a project. You tell them what your needs are in terms of how many data you need, how much this and that, what projects you're interested in. And then you move on and you collect your data. And then you write your paper with the university that you're in but also, you know, in conjunction with the Wolf Science Center. And it sounds like this was kind of all, not by accident, but not exactly planned. Did you realize at the time that wolf work was so competitive? Or in hindsight, were you like, oh my gosh, I'm, it's amazing that I got that. I'm so lucky. Yeah, so, okay. So here's what the interesting. So the perspective of someone from Europe, right? Because mm -hmm. the wolf work and the wolf research in Europe is a lot, is now expanding, but it was a lot more limited when I was trying to get into the oh, field. Yeah, there yeah. was a lot of basic ecology stuff, right? But not a whole lot of everything else. So it was hard to reach out to someone to actually do field work with wolves. So everyone was like, oh, we're not, you know, we don't have a whole lot of funding or the times didn't match up with my times and stuff. And when I tried the U.S., it was very obvious how much more competitive it was. And I also run into the hurdle of not being able to get the visa to fly out and, and do wolf work here. And a lot of people, I think, preferred either U.S. citizens because insurance was easier or because it was just a lot easier for people to move to that. You know, there's, a, I guess, a, a better guarantee that someone's going to move a different state to come and do your field work, but someone's going to move a whole ocean, right? Mm -hmm. Plus, it, it comes out of my own pocket and chip, tickets across the, the ocean are not cheap. So it was a realization at the time of how lucky I was, especially with the, how well organized the Wolf Science Center actually was. But I think I grown to appreciate it a lot more as I'm trying to get, you know, more into the field in terms of everything else that's going on. I think a lot of people knock on the captive work because it's probably not as exciting as the field work stuff. Obviously it's not wild wolves, but I think if nothing else, there's a valuable perspective to learn and there's context to develop if you want to. Yeah. In hindsight, I would probably, I don't know, I'm kind of like leaning stronger against like, don't volunteer, pay your labor, right? make sure your labor is paid perspective of things. But, you know, in this case, it, you essentially are getting paid in the data that you're creating. And, you know, there was support in terms of writing everything and stuff. And a lot of the context that I've developed, I still, you know, talk to now and still bounce ideas back and forth. And Yeah. Just going back to marine mammals quickly. Yeah. What was it that, like, I know you said you realized that you like mammals, but was, was there something particularly difficult about working with marine mammals that like prevented you from working with them? Or did you just kind of change your mind? Okay. So this is going to be a little bit of a bummer story, right? But originally okay. I wanted to you like, be, I like uh, reality here. Yes, I wanted to be a marine biologist and my parents thankfully were very supportive of that. And I lived in an island. So there was you know, there was the idea that there might be some work. We do have whales and dolphins in Cyprus. It's just very well, very understudied and not well understood. You know, my dad was like, okay, reached out to a marine biologist in Cyprus. 
I am going to talk to him. And for basically two hours, he kept talking about his experiment on shrimp and how shrimp are very fascinating and stuff. And I kind of sat there going like, I don't want to do experiments on shrimp. <laughs> so I talked to him and he's like, well, what do you like? And I was like, I like killer whales. I want to work with killer whales. And he just kind of looked at me and said, well, good luck, because it's probably not going to happen. And so I was devastated at the time when we got out of that because he, he was flat out saying it's a very competitive field. Not a whole lot of people get it. You know, the people that have killer whales in their waters frequently are likely to get more experience. So this guy basically crushed my, I guess at that point, 60 year old heart. But I think I'm forever grateful for that because it is a reality check. And I was devastated. And my dad just kind of leaked out and said, look, here's the deal. You like all animals, right? You prefer work on as you prefer dolphins, but you like all animals. Why don't you go get a bachelor in zoology and yeah. see what else you like in that area? And then if nothing else, you can still just try and go back into orcas from a different angle. And mind you, my dad is not familiar with wildlife stuff at all. This was just like his idea. It was like, okay, go in broad and then yeah. zoom in later on. And yeah. I asked that because I also have a lot of people who are interested in yeah. marine mammal careers and well, and just like predators. I say like you can 100 percent do it, but I want people to know that it's competitive and you've got to do it really intentionally and have a strategy. And and yeah, like you're really going to have to go for it specifically if that's what you want to do. But I'm sorry, your dreams were crushed, but it seems like you're doing super cool. Yeah, work, it worked out know. for the best for me, in my opinion. Yeah. So now you have your own organization. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about that? Like how you made the transition from your master's to founding your own organization and what that was like? Yeah, it all kind of started with a friend of my wife who lives up in the mountains who needed help because the coyote was getting into her chicken coop. Mm -hmm. And so we were like, hey, I can give it a go. And we tried to deter that coyote from getting into the chicken coop. Eventually succeeded, you know, word of mouth kind of spread around other people and other people wanted to be like, hey, we want to do this. It also kind of helped that I had camera traps or trail cameras available. Even the people that didn't necessarily want conflict, wanted conflict resolution, were interested to see what was, you know, doing the damage or doing this or, or doing that, right? Or what was kicking around in their backyard. So it kind of floated from there. And then I think a year in, I just kind of realized, you know what, I need at least some sort of official like banner to put these activities under, especially when you're looking to apply for jobs in the future, but also especially, you know, insurance, you know, any sort of limitations or any, anything like that. I wanted to make sure that everything was on the up and up in that regard. And so I decided I was going to fund my organization. I went the business route instead of the nonprofit route. And, um, yeah, it, it was mostly just twofold just to have an unofficial banner because I think, you know. Okay, I think it opens some sort of doors if, if you look for them, right? There, there's yeah. a difference between being some guy who just randomly emails someone and go like, hey, I want to come over to your house and put cameras for, you know, this reason. It seems a little, I don't know, like informal, sketchy, I guess is the word. I, I'm not really sure what the word would be. Not suspicious, but maybe suspicious. So but I can say nowadays. Yeah. The what? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> So it does seem a little sus. Like it's, I figured, you know, having that banner, having that logo, having that everything to put under your name under helps open some of these doors. And then also, yeah, there's some, you know, especially if you're in an LLC, there's you know, some protections against someone basically like benevolently getting your assets or, you know, for anything of the sorts like that. So. Can you talk about the decision? And this is called, it's called the Predator Detection and Deterrence. That's right. That's for to mention the names. This is great. <laughs> Can you talk about your decision to go the business route versus nonprofit? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and it was twofold. The first one was that, you know, mo most nonprofits require you to have a, a sort of committee, you know, to form a committee to make sure that, you know, everyone is not, no one's taking money, the money's being used properly. You're, your labor or your work basically aligns with the nonprofits, you know, what's the word values and stuff like that. And the, it's frowned upon to use your family for that. So it's at least based on the research that I did, it was really frowned upon for me to say, like, okay, my committee is me and my wife and my friend, Bob. And so that was one of the things I was like, okay, I don't know if I can get enough people to do this. And then I also want to follow my vision the way that I see it. And I've heard horror stories of, you know, 
committees kicking the original founders out or, you know, demoting them or stuff like that. And I just, you know, I didn't really want to do that. And so I figured that's one, one of the ways I was like, I don't really want to be involved in that aspect. But the other part of it, and the, the most important in my opinion, was the fact that as, as a business, I'm able to do environmental consulting work under the same banner. Mm-hmm. And because a lot of the human wildlife stuff, I'm now starting to charge more and more for that, that ability and the skills and everything like that. But originally I wanted it to be at least semi pro bono, if not fully like pro bono. Uh, and part of that is because it's, it's really hard to try and convince someone to not shoot an animal, but also pay you to not shoot that animal, if that makes sense. And so it's a, a much harder approach to say, Hey, I can help you solve your problem non-lethally because I solve my, my, you know, my motto is that I'm trying to solve it non-lethally, right? Uh, I'm not against lethal action, but I'm not going to take, I'm not going to be the one that takes lethal action. And so, yeah, it's just really hard to tell someone don't do the easiest route, not necessarily the best, but the easiest route, but also pay me. And so that the idea of getting money from one aspect of the business and then, you know, being able to do the other business pro bono meant that I was able to balance the books and not, you know, have it come out of my full pocket in all the time. So For the first person that you worked with when you were figuring out how to deter the fox, did you like know what you were doing? Did you do a lot of research or was it like a bunch of trial and error just to figure it out? Yeah. So it was a coyote and oh, sorry. it, no, I'm not. I'm not being facetious. I'm just saying, no matter the <laughs> research that you do with a coyote, it doesn't work. No matter what the books say, coyotes are, are a different animal altogether. But yeah, I had a basic understanding, a basic knowledge of what works, what doesn't work. You know, I did some research into USDA files. I contacted other people that I know have done deterrent work before and stuff like that. Basically, everyone said the same thing. Here's a list of things that we know work for coyotes, but good luck because they might not work for your coyote. Mm-hmm. And the, I, I think if you think of a coyote as a trickster, I think it's a title that's well earned. It took a lot of trial and error for sure. We tried a lot of normal stuff and then we tried some unconventional things. And then eventually the, the story is a little bit weird because eventually what stopped the coyote from getting into the chicken coop was the chicken door actually dropping on the coyote's head, like not killing it or anything like that. But I think it just fell on it and hit, hit him and he's, oh, I'm not going in there again. So I want to take credit, but it was really not, but it worked eventually. And, you know, now thinking back onto it, I would have handled it a thousand times differently, right? That's the value of experience, but it worked. And that was what it's important. And that coyote is alive or was alive. I, I assume at this point it's probably dead. It's been so long, but yeah. And, you know, that just kind of made more experience gathered and when you pit your mind against a coyote, everything else just kind of seems a little easier. So what's your process then? You go out and you put a bunch of camera traps up and examine the situation and see what <laughs> animal is involved and then try a bunch of conventional methods first and then adapt as, as depending on what works or what doesn't work? Yeah, it depends on what is available to investigate first, right? So if there is a, a dead carcass, that is relatively fresh and not all oh, touched a lot. I'll uh, we'll look to the carcass and see, you know, trying to determine what killed it. There's different, you know, different telltale signs between a coyote versus a mountain lion or a bobcat or so forth and so forth. And then obviously, if they have any sort of video footage, you know, when you look into that video footage, we, I do, I go around usually looking for trats or scat in some of the most common areas that I think animals would congregate. Then I, almost always advocate for the use of cameras, regardless, even if we know what that animal is, because the cameras can tell you what state that animal is mm-hmm. and can reveal potentially more things that could help you. I had a case study where I knew it was a, a mountain lion, but we didn't know how badly hurt that mountain lion was. So it was actually like really badly hurt in terms of the, it was limping like the front right paw really heavily and was really skinny. So it was obvious that that animal would be more desperate to get food as opposed to like an animal that's healthier. And, and then, yeah, depending on the urgency, I will put out non like the conventional, like the ones that I know work the most out the same day. I'll put out the deterrents that work out the most the same day and then adjust and see what well, the cameras also can tell you is this animal still frequenting the area? Is it frequenting it at a high rate or a low rate or has it, you know, does it react to the deterrent if you put a camera face in the deterrent? And then it's just a matter of, adjusting and then 
once we figure it out what works and the idea afterwards is to kind of leave the producers or the lies or the landowners or whatever to with a sustainable plan so i leave them with a document that says here is you know what's working right now here's what we know works or here's you know what might work based on what is working and then it's just basically a series of you know fail savings so like if a fails try plan b try plan c or try this or that obviously i maintain support during or throughout the whole thing but the idea eventually is to show the landowners or livestock producers whatever that they are the tools that they have at their disposal and how to use them so eventually they stop contacting me and are able to continue this long term yeah and i I initially contacted you or i was inspired to contact you because i had actually been working on this show the proof is out there where we look at a lot of weird images or videos, a lot of Bigfoot type stuff, and we say what we think it is, what animal it really is, or if it's a fake video. But the last time the segment was focused on animal attacks. So there was one on the mountain lion that didn't attack that runner, but Kate, but was defending her cubs. So I listened to a podcast that you were on and you did such a great job on that. And then on Instagram, a post came up in my feed of somebody who I followed her for business. Actually, she like Mm -hmm. advises mothers who are business owners. And she had a post about living close to the land and it had a dead fox in it. It was about teaching your kids to live close to the land. So at first, when I glanced at it, I thought they found a dead fox and they were teaching their child about life and death. Right. But I looked at the fox and I was like, this looks like a really healthy fox. They probably shot it. And that's what happened. And I commented on it and I got blocked right away. And I didn't say you anything mean or anything like that. And my sister commented, so she had some back and forth. But basically their argument was like, you don't understand. And it's not just as easy as putting up a fence. And then, you know, we were talking about how shooting them doesn't really work in the the long term. Can you talk a little bit about like why killing an animal is easy, but not effective in the long term? And then maybe some basic things that people can do if they're having a chicken coop or just a livestock protection problem. Yeah, absolutely. That's my bread and butter, right? (laughs) So there's, at least with canines, right? This works for all predators, but at least with canines and especially coyotes, the more animals that are killed, you know, they have a bigger vacuum in the area. Mm-hmm. And so animals that occupy territory no longer occupy it, right? So there's no animals in that space. And with coyotes, there is some research to indicate that they adjust their litter. So how many coyotes are born every season based on the availability of the territory around them. And so really, if you're killing, if you can go out and shoot a, a pack of coyotes, right? You're basically opening up that entire area to more coyotes coming in. And so you're just perpetually creating a problem for yourself because that area is going to be open. If the animal is there in the first place, it means that 95% of the time, it's a desirable location for them to be in. Unless if they're moving through it, in which case, if they're moving through it, there's no reason for you to shoot them because they'll be gone, right? By themselves. But if you have a desirable location for them to be in, they will just keep coming. And yeah, shooting them is the easiest way. You don't have to deal with it. You get it done. And then... You don't have to worry about it for another year or two. But the problem is is that unless if you are heavily monitoring your own land all the time for signs of predators, and even if you are, unless if you're out there all the time with guns ready to shoot any predator that comes in or you you see coyote sign and then you immediately go out to shoot coyotes or whatever, you are not going to be aware of the presence of these animals until they take another one of your livestock, Mm -hmm. right? So... I tell people you can do it. That's a route with, with some animals. It's a route that you can legally go down, right? In the case of coyotes in California, if you have a legal hunting license and a legal way to kill them, you can have at it, right? But it just creates more work for you in the long term. And I strongly advocate for what we call, what I call at least, I mean, so the common saying, the devil, you know. And so I say, okay, these coyotes that have your farm or your land incorporated into their territory. We can find out what scares them and keeps them away from spaces that you or your family, your livestock use, right? And these guys will stay out of those spaces because you found out what scares them, but they will protect their territory against other newer animals coming in. But if you shoot them, you don't know what scares the new animals. And sometimes it might be the same thing, but sometimes it might not. And 
So you're risking exposing yourself to an animal that might not be scared by the means that you know would be scared. And so you're risking your livestock, you're risking yourself or whatever. I don't think animal attacks in humans are a big deal, but in either case, you're risking all that because you're just going to be out there shooting them. So why don't you let the coyotes do half the work for you, right? Or the mountain lion do half the work for you or whatever, and you just keep it out of the spaces that you don't want. And I think it's important for people to realize that deterrents don't work 100% of the times in keeping the animal out of the ter- out of that area, but they work at making it move on. And that's what you want. Sometimes people will tell me, oh, I we put out fox lights, for example, which are little devices that imitate people walking around with torches. So I put out fox lights and the mountain lion is still coming by that pond. And I say, okay, well, does the mountain lion come by the pond, drink, and then leave? Yes. Okay, that's great because that mountain lion is not going to sit in that pond and try and find prey. It, it makes it uncomfortable, and that's what you want to do. You want to make those animals uncomfortable in those spaces and the fear that they're going to be killed so they move on somewhere else. And, but they are going to still use your space, especially if you have a feature such as water, which is highly desirable, especially in California. And so I, you just have to realize that's part of coexistence is the animals are going to use your space. You just don't want them to use it as much. And it, when it comes to coexistence tips, it isn't, it isn't as easy as putting up a fence, right? They obviously like sometimes putting a fence costs money that people don't have. It costs labor that people and time that people don't have, but it's not that hard to either do the fence or find a, a tools that do work for you. Like electrifying an area around the chicken coop doesn't have to cost a lot of money. There's a lot of budget solutions. There's in the age of internet, right? There's a lot of farmers that share their solutions to these things, right? Conventional or unconventional as they may be, budget solutions as to how to, you know, electrify your fence and how to do this or that. It's even as easy as, you know, at least I, for my line, sometimes I just tell people, buy a cheap radio, put it somewhere where it's not going to get wet if you don't want to buy a weatherproof one, right? And they just play recordings of people talking and that will 95% of the time keep mountain lines away from a location. Right. And that, that's, I guess that's the kind of the silver bullet when it comes to conflict is we're not trying to find deterrent that will scare everything away. We're just trying to find a lot of tools that are accessible and easy for people to do. Right. And use. And it does take a little bit of work, but I think, and this isn't just my opinion, this is based on people who I've talked to in the long run, it becomes a lot more easy. It becomes a lot easier and it becomes a lot cheaper down the line than just shooting them or losing animals and so forth. I love that. And most people, I don't think, realize would that, that talking would deter mountain lions because in movies, we don't get mountain lions as much, but still, like the predators, yeah. the movies, you know, they, you're at a campfire and they attack you. Yeah. So people don't realize that, yeah, most animals want to stay away from us. And if they hear humans, they leave. I mean, this, it's, it's really interesting that I, I also met a lot of people who have lived in the mountains for years on end who didn't realize that if you have a mountain lion patrolling your, your area frequently enough, you don't have coyotes in that same space, mm-hmm. right? Or coyotes will come and just book it, right? They don't stay in that space. And I tell people that hats are a lot more predictable in their routes, a lot more predictable in what can scare them and stuff like that. And so it's a, for me, I would much rather have a coyote, uh, a mountain lion, you know, roaming around and, and claiming my farm as a territory than I would coyotes, right? And then that mountain lion, if it's there frequently enough, will scare the coyotes away. And so you're just letting the animal do some of the work for you. Same goes for wolves and coyotes, but, you know, people don't have a different opinions of wolves than they do of mountain lions most of the time. But yeah. Is that just because mountain lions and wolves are easier to scare off than coyotes are? And coyotes are like more adaptable to deterrence? Yeah, absolutely. It, it's one of those things where they, they're a lot more like behavioral wise. They just got adapt to everything very fast. It's if you, if I were trying to do, de- if you were trying to deter a mountain lion, my plan would be like, oh, change a deterrent three to six weeks, depending on the mountain lion and depending on your location. But if it was a coyote, I'd say like every two weeks, you got to get out there. You got to change it. You got to change things up. You got to change it, not a little, but drastically, right? Because they just get used to everything so fast. Wow. Is that, do you have to do that chronically then? Or is there there a certain point where they realize like they're not welcome there or it's a problem? No, you have to keep it going. 
you have to keep it going, which is one of the parts where people say it's not easy. But it's if you put it as regular part of your routine, it's not that hard either. Uh, and it depends on, depending on what you want to do. Um, it can be a short-term solution or a long-term solution. But obviously, ideally long-term, you want to fence off areas or get dogs or range riders or something that is m much more permanent than, you know, mechanical deterrence, which can fail, can, you know, run out of battery or run their course or yada, yada, yada. So. Going back to the cost of fences, this woman, her account was the millionaire mother, so she can afford a fence or she should be able to afford. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's unfortunate. <laughs> it is, it's cheaper though, to just buy a bullet, right? And that's, that's the main problem is that, yeah, you're, I'm offering a solution that can be low cost, but you know, so for some people, it's just easier to go out and shoot the animal and it's a sad reality, but I'm hoping more and more people catch on to the fact that, yeah, you can just do this and let the animals do a little bit of the work for you and, you know, make it rest a little bit easier. How do you work on changing that narrative? And you mentioned in the beginning that there's people aren't necessarily wanting this, that they want to shoot it. So shoot them. So it might be that you have to convince them. And I'm so interested in like why people do things the way they do. And a lot of science in the past has been about education, but for especially for this incident with this woman, it seems like there are like some values really tied, tied to it. Like we're this kind of person and this is how we solve this kind of problem. So how do you handle that? Yeah, you ought to nailed it on the head. It's a very much like a, a values thing as well as education. So it's the way that I do it is that I often admit that I am an outsider, right? I don't have a lot of experience. I did my grandfather and his brother had sheep uh, and goats, but in Cyprus, the largest predator was a red fox. So you really only had to worry about uh, the lambs and the goat kids, right? And that was not really a worry that much. So in my, my experience is fairly limited on it, but it does help that there are already out there like homesteaders and ranchers and stuff that are making the change by themselves. Even either because they like the animals and they, they want to, you know, keep an ecosystem as intact as possible, or depending on the variety of values, like there's even people that are like, no, we are, we don't take lives where, you know, that kind of religion or this kind of belief system. I usually just kind of point to that and let people of that own community kind of do the talking. It doesn't always work. And sometimes when it doesn't work, I always just tell them like, Hey, let's try this out if they're inclined to at best what's the worst that can happen then you might lose another livestock but you're probably gonna lose one anyway so it's kind of give and take sometimes you have to just kind of i guess grin and bear it i've had people that are like well i i'm willing to try out some non lethal solutions but after i kill this coyote pack first right mm -hmm. and there there isn't much to, to do about that you just kind of say okay you wait until they do their thing if they kill the coyotes and then you kind of go back to it uh, and that's like one of the, one of the grimmest realities of this line of work is that you are going to have to accept the fact that you're never going to win a hundred percent, right? Uh, sometimes you're not going to win at all. Sometimes people are going to yell at you and throw you off their property or whatever, or this or that. And that's just part of it. But I think, you know, conceding some ground and have, trying, trying to meet them where mutually they're willing to be met is the first step, Right. And then slowly from there, you, at least I work on saying, Hey, if this worked, why don't we try this instead as well? Or if this worked for your neighbor, six miles down, it might work for you. And so I think for me, bringing practical examples of what has worked for other people in the past, it, within that community, even if I'm not part of it, it works a lot better than just me driving in there and be like, okay, here's what you need to do. Here's what this, here's what's that. Right. And it, it helps as well that in California, at least, legally speaking, you can't kill a mountain lion for depredation until you've had three depredations and have tried non-lethal measures. So deterrence and stuff like that. To get a permit, depredation permit from the Fish and Wildlife Department, you have to prove that you've had these things out and, you know, that you've tried and the mountain lion still won't stop killing livestock. Do you have any success stories that stick out in your mind? Um, oh, I have a ton of success stories. Or, yeah, share favorite. one with us. So like I have a, it, what kind of species, I guess it would be, because I have a bunch, but I guess mountain lions are probably like the more charismatic ones. Yeah, just choose whichever one. Yeah, I had a mountain lion 
uh, which was, I still monitoring, I think her, I think it might be her daughter at this point, uh, which I nicknamed Queen, not very original. But anyway, uh, and we, for, I first caught her on a conservation plot, which I was doing, I was running cameras for a different project, but I caught her on there and she was limping. And so I knew that there was cows grazing right next door. Literally for a mountain lion, it would be a nothing, right? And mountain lions don't usually attack cows, but they also, you know, get desperate. If you're desperate for a meal, anything is, is ready, ready to go. And so I reached out, contacted the rancher, found out who it was during, due through the people that I worked with and told them, Hey, just so you know, there's a mountain lion. It's limping, right? Could be a, an issue for the cattle. Here's what I can do to help you out with that issue. But originally the, the rancher was like, not very happy. Didn't want to work with us, whatever. He was like, thanks for the heads up, but I'll deal with it the way that I deal with it, which could mean a, a number of different things. Right. Uh, but eventually we, you know, I talked to them and the conservation manager for that whole lot, that plot that I was working on basically knew the rancher and was saying, Hey, here's the deal. We are trying to actively preserve biodiversity in our area. And it wouldn't do much help if they moved over to yours and get shot. Right. That's not how that works. And so they, they kind of put a little bit of pressure on him to at least try some non-lethal measures and he did. And we ended up putting out some fox fights and we ended up basically it was fox fights or radios. It wasn't a big deal. He thought it was going to be a much bigger deal. We're going to come out there with all this stuff. It was just fox fights or radios, but no animals were killed, you know, and that animal has been around in that area for a long time. I mean, it's just nice to think that maybe I had contributed to her well-being, yeah. right? Definitely. Uh, yeah, she's, uh, last time I caught her on camera was about six or seven months ago with her three cubs that were ready to move out. I haven't caught her since, so I'm not sure if she was being boarded by a male, but I'm not sure if she got kicked out of her territory because she's old or yeah. what. But it was just a nice, you know, it's always nice to pick her up on camera and get and be like, oh yeah, this is that one. Line. She's blind on one eye now, so I could tell very easily who it was, but yeah. And do you do virtual help as well? If somebody in Kansas needs help? Which yeah, I try. It's kind of hard without getting the lay of the land, you know, like I much prefer to be there in person because the landscape matters so much in terms of what you're going to put down, deterrent wise, where, and all that kind of stuff. But I think like I, I have talked to people before in Montana, Idaho, uh, let's see where else, Texas. Anyway, yeah, I've talked to a, a few people here and there in scattered in states, but mostly about just like what your options are. And also the most important thing, in my opinion, how to prevent that habituation, how to prevent those animals getting used to those deterrents. Because a lot of these things are seem cool in idea and they work for a little bit and then they don't work anymore. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people are like, well, why did you stop working? And yeah, just animals get used to things, right? And that's the key point. Yeah. And then last question, what advice do you have for somebody going into this field, especially if they want to do like predator or carnivore type of work? Oh, God, it's a very competitive field, right? I think I've been lucky enough to find this little niche of the concept of work that is, is ever growing now, uh, but it's still not that big. So I've been lucky enough to occupy that. And I think that would be my advice is to just try and find something that you enjoy, but also something that is not so widely spread right now. And again, it's getting harder and harder with predators now because yeah, this is this and that, you know, that, that's the only way that I think you can avoid a lot of the competitiveness that comes with the field. But by all means, I often just tell people like, hey, if you think you are up for the competition, you should definitely try and apply for different positions and different this and different that, because yeah, you might be the one that gets it, right? But also have a plan B. And, if, if, you know, I think a lot of people, and this was something that I realized as well during my undergraduate, a lot of people tend to think of themselves as, okay, I want to work with, with this species or this particular uh, group of animals. And they always think of themselves as working hands-on with that animal and, you know, like this and that. And I think there needs to be more realization that you can still work to the benefit of the animal. You can even still work with the animal, but like have a different position than what you envision it to be. I mean, a lot of research now, especially with predators and stuff is all quantitative, right? And a lot of models and a lot of this and that. And so there are people that like more often than not aren't out in the field anymore. And so, and, that, and it's still valuable work. 
And so I think it just kind of depends on, do you, do you envision yourself in the traditional role of observing like lions with your binoculars and this and that? Because it, there might be a position available for you for that, but those are so far a few in between anymore than trying to find something else. Do you like lions try and, and figure out ways to work in that conflict area or, you know, try and figure out ways of like preserving the habitat that lions might use. And I think it sounds kind of defeated in a way, but I think it's just important to realize that you, there are other avenues to working with those animals that are not the traditional one that we often all envision to be. Right. And a lot of times it's working with people too. When I yeah. was doing the research on leopards, the thing that made a difference, they did study the leopards and they realized a lot of the translocation of problem leopards didn't work. And it was more about teaching the people how to live alongside leopards and like you said, teaching them how to deter them. That is definitely something that you hear older biologists tell you and you don't believe it when you're like brash and you feel like, oh, I'm not going to work with humans. I'm going to be out in the woods all day. And then you're like, <laughs> you know, I'm 33 now and like 95% of my work is being like, yes, let's talk about all these things that are just being like, come on, you know? And it's really funny when, you know, when you're with someone who doesn't work this line of work and you're actually hiking or whatever, and you come across like tracks or scads, and you're like, don't you see this every day? You're working. You're like, no, I don't. Not anymore. I don't know. So I want to enjoy it and savor it. And I think as it goes on, I think one of the things that people are scared about losing is that connection to nature, right? Because people in our field definitely don't do it for the money. And I think there, there's always that loss of, well, I don't want to go behind a computer and just analyze a bunch of data because then I'm not going to be out there and stuff. And I think what I advise people to do who reached out to me is, okay, find a nature adjacent hobby. You might be working every day on DNA research, which is not very hands-on with the animal, right? But if you're doing it, then maybe try and find a place that lets you volunteer as a nature educator. Go out there and teach kids what to do and what is what in their woods and stuff like that. Because that kind of job lets you get that nature fix that you so desperately want. And then you also can go back to your day-to-day -day job contributing to a, a species of field that you really like. But knowing that you're not going to fill that traditional role of person in khakis running around in the woods. Really quick, do you interact with the animals directly ever? And if so, okay, it's all camera traps. Nope. I mean, I've seen animals before. Yeah. The all the handling and stuff like that, if it does happen, happens through California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And that makes sense. I don't think I'm trying to find if there's ever been an instance of no, no, I actually no. I mean, I've deterred coyotes away from areas and bears, right? By banging on pots and yelling and air horns and all that kind of stuff, yeah. but never like actually interacted with them in any other way. So it's kind of sad. Like I don't think joke around that my job is to love these animals by scaring them, right? Because that's what it is. You're just trying to keep them safe, but you're also scaring them. So that, that's why I also, I, I love cameras because it is the way that I remain in touch, right? You get to observe love these animals and yeah. Even for the common animals. I mean, sometimes you get bored looking at all the deer and squirrels, but sometimes I do something really interesting. Or yeah, fun. sometimes, yeah. You're like, this is so cool. Hazing was the word I was thinking of. That's the word. Oh, yeah, thinking. hazing. There we go. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. This was Absolutely. an I could really ask you so many more questions. I love this topic. Thank you so much. And maybe I'll invite you back for another one then. Hey, happy to be. Okay. Great. Thank Great. you. Thanks. Thank you so much again, Petros. I really loved our conversation. I can talk about human wildlife interactions all the time. I find it so fascinating. And I love that Petros brought up something that I talk about a lot is when we're working with carnivores, scientists a lot of times, most of the time, by far most of the time, are not working hands-on with them. They're doing it through non-invasive methods like camera traps so often we don't even see the animal and that's just something important to think about when you're moving forward in your wildlife career is what's really important to you is the science part important the conservation application or really interacting with the animals and I wanted to include all of Petro's links on the show notes they're there his organization is predator detection and deterrence you can follow him at Instagram. You can follow him on Twitter 
at P-C-H-R-Y-S-A-S-I-S. I'm just going to include the Instagram a link in the show notes. But if you Google him, you'll be able to find him. He pops up right away. Thanks, guys, so much. I have an amazing day. Be kind to each other. Be kind to wildlife. And if you're having problems with wildlife, look to non-lethal methods first. A lot of times they work better and they are more effective in the long run.